Looks like we might be live. See if we can get a few thumbs ups before we get underway. <laughs> I've got my coffee or tea ready, Tim. I've got a water. <laughs> Thanks for checking in, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's none left, actually. There's a <laughs> acting drink. Cool, we've got a couple of thumbs up there, so that's great we might get straight into it so welcome to another week of lunch money for those of you who are new to lunch money we do these every thursday at lunchtime and they're also available as a podcast on spotify apple podcasts and google podcasts my name is leighton i'm one of the co-founders of sharesies this is sonia she's also one of the co-founders of sharesies and today we're chuffed to be joined by a recurring guest of our uh, of our um, podcast janae uh, she has joined us here before, like I said, and is a journalist at interest.co.nz. Janae is based in the Parliamentary Press Gallery and reports on personal finance and policy that affects the economy. Just a reminder that if you have any questions for us, you can submit them through the Ask a Question button down below. Don't leave questions in the discussion area as they're likely to get missed and we don't really follow along with that. Legal disclaimer, no personalised advice here. Uh, investing involves risks. You aren't guaranteed to make money and you might lose the money you start with. We don't provide personalised advice or recommendations and any information we provide is general only and current at the time. Finally, please be kind and respectful towards uh, both our speakers and your fellow viewers. Otherwise, we have to take steps to remove you from the webinar and that's not something we want to have to do. Sonia, I'll hand over to you to introduce Janae. Yeah, great. So um, there's been a couple of big economic announcements over the past fortnight. Um, so, you know, the reason for lunch money and why it exists is to, for us to be able to really um, dig into some of these things and, and give a chance to kind of ask any questions so we can um, make sure we're keeping um, on top of what's going on. So the big announcements have been uh, the government's budget for 2021 and also the Reserve Bank's latest announcement on the official cash rate. Um, so we've got Janae here um, to today to share her insight on what these things mean for the economy and for investing. Um, so welcome back to Lunch Money, Janae. Sure, Hi, Janae. thanks for having me. Thanks for coming back. Um, and so, and just another shout out on the Ask a Question, please do make sure you get some questions in the Ask a Question section um, for Janae uh, at the end. Um, so let's start with talking about budget. Um, so if we look at the budget 2021, uh, can you give us a bit of a rundown of um, you know, what the budget is? Okay, um, so every year the uh, government announces um, where all the money, um, allocations of, of money, it says, you know, we're gonna fund X amount for this and X amount for that. Um, and and then at the same time, Treasury releases a bunch of forecasts around how it thinks the economy is going to perform. You know how much tax it thinks it'll receive, and and how that compares to the um, expenditure. So this has been it happens every year. At the moment, I guess it's particularly uh, exciting if, if if you want to think of it that way, um, because the numbers are that much larger because the government is providing so much stimulus. Um, into the economy um, due to COVID-19. And also because we have a bunch of long-standing, uh, I guess, uh, deficits like with um, infrastructure, we, we desperately need more infrastructure, things like that. Um, so, so we're talking larger numbers than, than we have in previous years. Yeah, cool. And um, can you tell us a bit about what happens on Budget Day as a journalist? Yeah, so it's a bit of a big day. We all go into a lockup um, at Parliament at the Beehive, and so um, journalists and financial analysts and um, different people from uh, business groups and so on. We we go into a, a big hall and we get the budget. And there's no internet or anything like that. We get we get a big wad of documentation, and they go go, and you've got to. <laughs> it's like being in an exam, and you have about three hours. To, to look at all the material and write your story and then and the finance minister comes in and he takes some questions and then at two o'clock um, you hit publish and everyone hits publish and and there it is and the reason there's a lock up is because the information is market sensitive so it all needs to come out at the same time it's really important no one um, breaks that um, and the reason they give it to us ahead of time is because there's so much in there if they just sent it out and said go for gold, publish it straight away, then people wouldn't be able to have enough time to digest it and write a proper story. Yeah. Well, that is amazing. Um, for Just for numbers, like how many people are we talking about locked in a room together reading? <laughs> curious? Yeah, quite a few. Um, maybe, actually, hard to judge, maybe 100. Um, wow. And 
Uh, so there's a, it's a pretty good buzz because you get in there and there's the other journos and there's economists and you kind of, you know, everyone's silent for the first part, frantically writing, and then you sort of have a wander around the room, chat to people and go, oh, what did you think? And what do you think of this? What do you think of that? It's it's quite good. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's quite a big day. And then in the evening, you go to the pub and you talk to everyone about it and um, and you hope that your take is, is, is a good take compared to everyone else's takes. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't sound like you get to sleep on it overnight, but <laughs> I'm sure you No, do. no. I mean, the other thing to point out is that it's a very political day. So um, some of the best analysis that you'll see on the budget will come in the weeks following it. I mean, it's almost impossible to, to have a really cohesive thing and it written in three hours. So I guess tip for people reading the news, wait for some of the analysis in the days following. That is a great yeah. tip. <laughs> now that we have the context of how it all comes together, <laughs> um, yeah. pretty amazing. Um, so coming back to the actual detail that was in the budget, um, you know, what are the, what are the highlights? Like, what should we what should we be keeping an eye on? What's what's the top top things about the budget for this year? Um, so the the wealth increases to welfare is, was kind of the headline of the budget that caught everyone's attention, um, and. Yeah, there's also increases in funding for um, infrastructure as well. So, so I guess a few things um, with with the welfare increases, uh, the government I guess ha had the view that it needed to continue stimulating the economy um, due to COVID nineteen, and I guess putting some more money in the pockets of um, the lowest sort of income people is is a stimulatory thing to do because the, those people will spend that money. So I guess there's a, other than the sort of social element of it, which is obvious to everyone, I mean, house prices are so much, rents are so much higher, cost of living, all that. Um, there's also a bit of an economic side to it. So th there's that. Um, and then, I mean, the infrastructure spend is the really interesting one that is the difficult one because the government has allocated all this money to building much needed infrastructure. But um, and that is really central to New Zealand's economic recovery um, and also just important because we need to be able to get around and have our water pipes not break and things like that. But the government has struggled to get the money out of the door. So it's one thing at budget day saying, oh, billion here, 500 million there, whatever, whatever. But getting it into the economy, getting stuff done is the challenging part. And I think that's, um, and that's largely because of capacity constraints, like having people, the right people with the right skills to actually do the work. And I, I think if you talk to a lot of businesses, that's what everyone's um, struggling with. So yeah, so I think that those are the two standout things for me. The people in the business community complained and said, well, there's not actually much in here for us. Um, and I mean, that is potentially a point, but um, I'll just, Rewind to last year, the government has actually put quite a lot of support for businesses in place. There are um, loan schemes uh, that the business will give, uh, the government will write businesses loans, and the government is also underwriting some bank loans um, to businesses. It was wage subsidy, there have been some tax changes. Arguably, there could be some more tax changes for businesses um, to, to make it, uh, I guess, encourage them to invest. So, so that's something that I think National has raised that is, is a fair point. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that that's kind of my view, my view of it, of it. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for that. Um, was there anything that surprised you in the budget? Um, yeah, actually there was something that, um, so everyone, or oh, like economists and, and so on thought that the government would revise down its forecast debt issuance, um, outlook and and actually issue quite a bit less debt than it thought it would issue because the economy is performing better than expected but as it turned out uh the government is or treasury is still expecting to issue quite a lot of debt so 30 billion dollars of um of bonds are expected to be issued that's debt in the next year and and that's quite a bit because two years ago we thought that in this period we'd be issuing eight billion dollars of bonds so 30 billion is versus eight, which is in normal times, is, is still quite a bit. Um, there'll, there'll be some people who think the government should be issuing heaps more, getting more stuff done, just get in there, get it done. And you know, that that is that's a perspective, but I think 30 billion is still quite a lot. And um, there's once again, it's, the, it's one thing uh, allocating the money 
it's another thing actually spending it. And the government has a lot of money sitting in its basically in its bank account at the Reserve Bank, just sitting there. It's borrowed it. It's borrowed money, just sitting there waiting to get it into the economy. So I think that is that is kind of the ultimate challenge. And debt seems to be like a, an area of contention around like how much debt we should be carrying and things like that. Can you just talk a bit about, um, you know, what's going into these decisions around how much debt we should be taking on and, and how does this affect um, New Zealanders today, but also later down the track around where we put this line or where the line yeah. gets made on debt? I mean, the debt debate is is really fascinating. Um, something that is worth pointing out is um, back back in the day, a lot of New Zealand's debt came from um, other countries. So we, we borrowed from offshore. So when you borrow from offshore, you're, um, you know, there's not much leeway, right? You got to you have to repay that when the overseas people say you need to repay it. But what's happening in this crisis is we're borrowing. The government's essentially borrowing from itself. So its issue, Treasury is issuing bonds, which is debt, into the market, and investors are buying those bonds. It's an asset, you know, it's a good, nice, safe asset. They're buying the government debt. And then the Reserve Bank is coming along and, and committing to buying those bonds from the investors who have bought them. So all, a whole bunch of this debt is actually sitting on the Reserve Bank's balance sheet. The Reserve Bank owns the bonds. And so currently it's bought over $50 billion of bonds. So, so it, it changed the dynamic a little bit because it's like one arm of government issuing debt to the other arm. It's a bit different to when um, we owe some, some person overseas all the money or, you know, a bunch of investors. So in my view, because of that, we there, there's no real need to panic too much about this debt. And, and Treasury has said that um, what, what could happen is uh when the bond matures so when um the the investor or, or the reserve bank um when treasury needs to to repay them they could just roll that bond over again and they could keep rolling it over and rolling it over it's kind of like if you have a mortgage for 20 years 20 years runs out and then you go oh, actually we'll just do it for another 20 years another 20 years and then eventually there's been inflation and it's easier to to repay that so so that so treasury suggested that that could be something that they look to doing but, you know, on the flip side, um, people, are, you, you, the government can't just take out a whole bunch of debt and, and not show what it's doing with it. And I think that's where it needs to have a bit more transparency to say, OK, we, we launched this program. There's a big song and dance about this thing. And here's the outcome of it. And I don't think there's been enough of that. Like um, of all the different COVID initiatives uh, Treasury can't say how much of the money that's been allocated has gone out the door for like breaking it down in terms of initiatives as they've been announced. So, I, in my view, no need to panic heaps about debt, but there needs to be stuff to show for it, and I think they could do a much better job at that. Yeah, cool. And um, I guess thinking of you know this debt and what you said about the was it eight billion was what was originally um, kind of thinking that it would be and it's 30 billion, which is like so much more. Yeah. Um, what do you think, you know, this one is a large focus of it is around recovery. And what do you think this says about how the recovery is going, but also um, what we're kind of expecting um, from COVID or how we're preparing for what might happen over the next year? Mm. I think, um, I think there's still so much uncertainty and while in New Zealand we feel like our lives, our lives are fairly normal, the, the world is not normal and um, <laughs> I'm not sure whether it ever will go back to the way it was, probably, probably not. Um, and I think the government wants to, um, you know, signal that it's still going to be there, it's still going to be um, providing support and stimulus, not as much as what some people want, um, but, but it is... It is there. there. There are also some um, key drivers of economic growth that are, are, are coming off. So, for example, house price growth is projected to drop right off. So, not house prices aren't expected to go into negative. They're just expected to basically not increase. I mean, who knows if that's actually going to happen? Um, but but that's always been a driver of economic growth. In New Zealand immigration, you know, that's expected to come right back down. Um, tourism, another income earner. Not sure what's happening there. Even things like dairy, there's with the, with the move to having a, a better sort of 
climate friendly economy some of those um heavy industries oil and gas they're coming off and i mean i don't know where the growth's coming from where we need to think of new industries new investment there's obviously infrastructure but um yeah i mean there's some uncertainties around these things yeah and um you know do, do you think that there's anything missing um from from the budget that we're not that hasn't kind of been raised or talked about um sort of uh yeah i think renting working people will be thinking what's in this for me so um i think it's good to not just look at the budget in isolation but look at the COVID recovery more generally and asset owners people who own houses or shares have actually been really really well supported and this is largely by the reserve bank so the reserve bank has slashed interest rates um, and by doing that people's mortgage repayments have been cut right back down um which is you know good have, you have more money in your pocket every week because you're paying less on your mortgage and also those asset prices have inflated enormously so i mean people might think well i'm not realizing those gains because i'm not selling my house i'm not selling my shares but i guess you've got more equity you've got more options so so asset owners have received a lot of support um and now in the budget beneficiaries um received support i, I think that's a good thing and but there'll be renting people who are working hard, who are thinking, well, what's, where, where, what am I getting? And to be honest, probably not, not getting anything uh, directly, but what, what working people are getting is, I guess, the stimulus that's being provided by all these things should help you keep your job. Now, some people think, well, yeah, I keep my job and what else? But um, I think politically, potentially closer to the next election, when the real battle for the middle ground vote, voters is on, then we might see the government start to put some sweeteners out there for middle New Zealand or for, you know, just working people. Um, that would make sense. Something I think would be great is to do some, um, I guess, like income tax, <laughs> some, the, the make lower income people or, or, or that lowest um, tax threshold lower that or just kind of reduce the amount of tax people pay for going to work and increase the amount of tax people pay for buying and selling stuff um but that's complicated and politically difficult but yeah we might see something come up in the space closer to, to the election i think yeah cool and what is the implications um you know obviously thinking of our audience um, being investors, what is the implications or the connection between the budget uh, and what investors um, can expect or how this impacts investors? Mm. I think the message is probably that the government is there providing a whole lot of stimulus and there's a lot of money going <clears throat> into the economy. And if you look at the budget coupled with what the Reserve Bank's doing, all that it, globally, there's so much liquidity, like other governments are doing this and they're doing it way more than our government's doing, just chucking it in, all this money and that's sloshing around and um, investors are looking for yield. So I guess for investors that um, people will have seen that share prices are just going up and up. Um, but the thing to think about, I guess, is why are some of these asset prices inflating and is that sustainable inflation? It, it's like is it inflating are these shares and things worth more because that company is doing really well or, or is it worth more because um there's all the stimulus and um there's just money that needs to find a home basically yeah cool that's a good um segue i'll pass over to you later <laughs> yeah we've sort of covered a bunch of it already but we might move into the ocr so move away from the government's budget and into the reserve banks announcement around the official cash rate. Uh, I think last time we had you here, actually, we were talking specifically to um, the OCR and, and covered what that was as well. So maybe you could quickly remind uh, everyone here what the OCR actually is and what it's there for. Okay, so the Reserve Bank, one of its main jobs is to try to um, keep inflation at between one and 3% a year and also have maximum sustainable employment. And the way that it um, can do that is it's largely doing that by setting uh, wholesale interest rates. And that's kind of what, what the OCR is. Um, and that's at 0.25%, which is rock bottom. And what's happened with COVID is because traditionally we've just used like change the OCR up and down depending on economic conditions. So cut it if we want more stimulus, we want lower interest rates, we want people to spend, borrow, invest, 
and boost inflation and the OCR would be higher if, if the economy is too hot and um, and we, we want some of that heat to come out of it. Now, for years, the economy inflation has been stubbornly low, which is why the OCR has been lowered and lowered to try to provide more and more stimulus. COVID comes along, the OCR is already super low, so the Reserve Bank has to look at new ways of trying to um, stimulate the economy, right? And that's why it's done um, some other things like quantitative easing or its large scale asset purchase program. Uh, it's been buying lot, lots of bonds to try to put down pressure on those interest rates. And it's also lending banks money for cheap with the hope that that would then help them lower their mortgage rates and their term deposit rates. So um, yeah, it's kind of in, it's still in emergency kind of mode Hope the stimulus that that that's that's the vibe, and um, yeah, and I guess that the thing is is that the the way it's stimulating the economy is largely through debt, <laughs> mm. getting people to take out more debt, and when people and yeah, so there's questions as to whether that's um, a really sustainable way of stimulating the economy, but that's what central banks all around the world are doing. Yeah, in that sense, it sort of seems like the US has been in. Um, crisis mode since 2008 then, doesn't it? Uh, given that they've been using these tools pretty actively right through. Um, and yeah. New Zealand's only really picked up, particularly into the, um, the less common prudential tools, I suppose, like the um, quantitative easing and stuff that um, it's, I'm finding that super, super interesting at the moment. But I think it um, brings nicely into our next question, which is around, um, they've decided to keep the OCR flat um, which is quite different probably. Uh, you just said um, that the OCR is now at rock bottom at 0.25%. I imagine that last time we were talking about the OCR, we were probably talking about a real risk of negative interest yeah. rates. And um, that's one of the big things that's changed in the OCR announcement this time and that they've started to give some guidance that they think it's going to increase. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about what that means and what that, how that might impact some people. Sure. Um, right. So because all around the world, there's all the stimulus, um, now people are starting to think, OK, well, when is all of this going to cause um, inflation to rise? And um, and so if inflation rises too much, then central banks around the world need to rein things in by increasing interest rates. Right. And so last week, when the Reserve Bank uh, four times a year, it has this uh, releases a monetary policy statement, has a press conference, provides all this information about what it's thinking, and it's it said that uh, projected OCR hikes from mid next year. Now this surprised markets quite a bit because they didn't think the Reserve Bank would be so definitive about it, but the Reserve Bank had to acknowledge these inflationary pressures because everyone's talking about them. Um, so I guess it had to balance a bit of sort of a bit of a balancing act because it had to acknowledge, okay, this inflationary pressures are there, but actually our current settings are still really stimulatory. And in, in the Reserve Bank's view, they need to remain stimulatory for some time to come. Um, so I guess the, the big question is whether some of these inflationary pressures are temporary or, or not. And the Reserve Bank thought that they were fairly temporary. Um, so these are things like oil prices are really high at the moment. Um, there's supply chain issues, which are putting up prices, you know, like ships are getting stuck at ports and goods and services can't move around the world as easily. And that's putting up prices. Um, so, yeah, so, so will these things um, go away or, or will they linger? And also some, some of those structural things that have prevented inflation from rising, are they still there? So, so, so that's things like globalization means that you can now buy stuff around the world for really cheap and prices of goods and services aren't really going up because you just go online and, 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 you know, the price of TVs and things aren't really increasing. So are some of those structural things ultimately still there? And I guess this is the big question at the moment. How temporary are these inflationary pressures? I don't know if, um, I'm not really too sure, but I'm not sure if, Anyone else has his views on that? Uh, you know, I, I do have a view, <laughs> uh, and it is definitely my own view. But I, I was um, still working in banking. We talked about this earlier when um, interest rates started to increase last time, and they went, they moved quite fast. Actually, I think they moved them twice in a row. So probably went up about fifty basis points or 0.5 of a percent over two two announcements, and um, and it 
the, the impact on the economy. So um, for the context, what this does immediately is puts home loan rates up, um, which is the biggest impact basically towards someone's spending. And as a result, that has an immediate flow on impact into someone's discretionary income. And that discretionary income is the amount of money that they can spend at any time. Uh, and of course, when you're in an environment where it's hard, you know, terrorism is completely out the door, uh, doesn't really look like it's going to be here in a year. That's sort of hard to, that feels like a bit of a stretch. And it, it, you know, from where I'm sitting, uh, it sort of looks like we're going to be needing to encourage some people with discretionary income to keep spending as much as they can around uh, as long as possible. And, a, you know, a, a, an approach of putting interest rates up doesn't seem like that's the best way to achieve that. So um, I was also surprised to read it. Um, like I say, I've been through it. The, the one I was talking about, which I think was probably around 2000. 11 2012 um was reversed reasonably quickly mm. um and might have been a little bit later than that but uh it, 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 uh, one thing i know for sure certainly about um how adrian Orr has sort of acted as the governor so far you mentioned the word definitive before and it does seem to be a, a little bit of a good way of describing um how the reserve bank's managing these things at the moment and they do like to put out bold statements and mm -hmm. i think they're also equally um open to changing those based on your information so like i guess i, I agree with you basically it's a lot of unknown around there um but based on my own probably much more limited knowledge than theirs <laughs> of course <laughs> of, of where this is heading it feels like a bit of a struggle to get to that point yeah and and um, and you raise a really good point about um not raising rates too soon and spooking the horses and then um, having to cut them again um, that that wouldn't that, that wouldn't uh, be, be good I, a part of me wonders as well whether the reserve bank is thinking it is good to talk about the potential of, of higher rates just to calm households down and make sure people are thinking and I don't know if this is the reserve bank's intention or not I've got no idea but I think from my perspective, I think it is a good idea that we are talking about the, the potential for interest rates to rise so that when people take out mortgages, which they've done with so much vigour over the past year, they're thinking about, well, can I service this mortgage if interest rates go up? And I think it's a kind of a good reminder um, mm. for that. Absolutely. There's just a good conversation, like, um, a question come through actually, which we can probably answer now while we're on the topic, which was around... Um, uh, advising how changes in the OCR directly impact uh, exchange rates. So um, basically the, the OCR represents what you might call a risk-free rate for banks. So it's the money that they, they get risk-free from the government or the, the Reserve Bank when they're borrowing or loaning money. So um, when they change this, that risk-free rate changes a lot. So if you think about it from your deposit point of view, uh, at the moment you get no money on deposits because the banks themselves only are re receiving 0.25% from the reserve bank. So there's not a lot of pass-through going on there um, for all the money that they earn sitting in your um, transactional accounts, um, which would previously have been well, they, uh, quite a significant revenue line for, for the banks. Uh, and then on the other side, on your home loan, um, interest rates have gone down so much because what the bank is having to pay um, the Reserve Bank for this money is much less and as a result you see the benefit of that flow straight through into your home loan and the, the, the most visible place for this tends to be your variable rates which are normally priced off um, an, an interest rate that's pretty close to the to the OCR um, as a starting point or um, more likely a 90 day rate but you know that's only three months out from from where that is so the the, the um, there is literally, um, if you're running the pricing books from a bank, uh, one of your key levers or judgments as to where that pricing is going to be set comes directly off where the OCR is sitting and how that's impacting the um, the the interest rates at the time. Uh, and then I guess what's more significant out of this particular discussion is the is the interest rates into the future. So um, if you have uh, a reserve bank that's saying interest rates are going to increase, and we all here know that we can get a two year fixed mortgage or a five year fixed mortgage, then um, the, you start to look at this curve that's created on where interest rates are priced at any given time. And uh, at the moment, they're starting to go like this again. And for a long time, they've been looking like this because we've been saying, hey, it looks like we're going to be dropping. We're going to be dropping. So mm -hmm. now um, we might start to see the longer term interest rates. And that's um, less related to the OCR directly and more related to, to the story that the Reserve Bank is telling on where they think things are going. So um, it, it's, it's all a little bit art and science. I think a lot of people would argue it's very much science. And a lot of people <laughs> would argue it's very much art, but I think it lands somewhere in between um, based on information they have. Anything you'd like to add to that, Janae? Or? 
Yeah, I mean, and you might know this, but would you say uh, banks and things are like looking for reasons to increase interest rates because it's um, oh, uh, the tiniest little signal of uh, um, of oh, inflation's coming. They're like, yes, it's coming. Like, put them up because it's um, <laughs> it's more um, profitable. And but mm. I guess it, yeah. But that's yeah, banks, tend, banks tend to make money in increasing race, interest yes. rate environments. That's correct. Uh, and um, the, uh, the the only decision, obviously, is not interest rates. There's a whole competitive environment around there as well. So that's the other massive impact that comes in when you're trying to balance this. It's like on one hand, we've got an opportunity here to go up, but there's often a bit of a waiting game. And it's like, well, we'll wait for one of the other ones someone else to go or I might move in these three you know everyone's got their own strategies around it and it tends to um, the flow on impact into um, gaining new customers and stuff to the banks is immediate so I'm sure there's it's a particularly interesting time there as well uh, and then of course flowing that through to investments and how that um, that matters for all of us sitting here listening at the moment well um, interest rates right now you can get some sort of blue chip blue chips so I'm talking about your big energy stocks and stuff which has seen a lot of price inflation or price increase since um, since COVID, and, and that's because they tend to pay, uh, pay really reliable dividends regardless of what's happening in the economy. And uh, if previously you could get basically risk-free money from the bank, 3% from a term deposit, you were pretty happy with that and you decide, hey, I won't take the risk of a company here that pays 5% because you know that, that risk measure of 2% difference just doesn't quite work for me right now. But when the bank deposit changes down to 1%, then you think, hey, um, actually, I'm, I should look at seriously look at this risk for the five percent I can get over here, and maybe that four percent different is enough for me. And that's what's happened for a lot of people, and that's why we've seen so much money come into companies. So, um, the risk to investors, I suppose, around this increasing is that, well, if if the inflation has driven something from which is not companies increasing their ability um, for output and for revenue and, and growth, then um, there is a chance that company the prices of companies will decrease through people more looking to sell again because they're once again comfortable with the term deposit rate so there's lots of factors all of them are ifs and, and maybes and um you know they're always way easier to talk about in hindsight than, than looking into the future mm. um uh so i'll just go into the um the last question on the ocr so it's specific to the um the what we were talking about the reserve bank sets the ocr the government sets the budget can you just tell us like are they the same thing are they different like how, how do these two things interact okay so the <clears throat> the reserve bank um has its two goals that inflation and having inflation at, a, at around two percent and em employment and it uses largely um interest rates so the ocr and also its quantitative easing that the bond buying that affects interest rates so it uses its tools to, to meet those um goals and then over the road the government does is completely separate and it says okay what do we need to spend money on these these things and how much money do we need to borrow this much and we're going to borrow that money and and um to buy all these oh you know to, to invest in, in whatever but the there's been some so, so they're just they're separate but there's been some crossover, I suppose, recently since the Reserve Bank's been doing its quantitative easing. So as I mentioned before, what's happening now is that um, because a lot of the government debt is actually ending up being bought by the Reserve Bank um, and by the Reserve Bank buying all of that debt, becoming such an active player in the bond market, that has been suppressing um, bond yields, which has actually been flowing through and suppressing interest rates. So that there's been some sort of like co-benefits there because the government's needed to issue all this debt and the reserve banks bought all the debt um and through it doing that it's it's helping achieve its goal of of keeping rates low um but something that uh people get quite worked up about is <laughs> that grant robertson's not going to adrian or and going oh adrian can you print me some money because i want to pay for the wage subsidy um th those things are being done separately now if uh if the government issues less debt and the Reserve Bank has fewer bonds to buy, um, then that means that that tool that it was using to suppress interest rates by doing all the bond buying is not going to be as effective because there's less like room for it to be a really active player in that market. So if it can't do that quite so much, which, which it actually can't because the government is still issuing less debt than it thought it would a year ago, um, then it might need to use other tools like the OCR to provide that 
that stimulus. Now, a few months ago, we thought, well, this is quite a possible thing. But now that everyone seems to think inflation is returning more quickly, that that talk is is, is not so much there. Um, but there are people who, I mean, say that why why do we have to go through the banking system in the middle? Why can't the Reserve Bank just buy the debt straight from the government, get it done, cut out the banks in the middle? Um, and and that's an interesting question. And then people say, well, if we start doing that, when, when does it end? And what if you have a dodgy government? Um, and also, what would overseas investors think about it if we do it that way? But it's been a really interesting year because I sort of just think it's good to talk about all the different options because what we've done has we've never really done this type of thing before. And the discussion that's come up just this week is because the Reserve Bank has done all this bond buying and its balance sheet is so big, if it decides that it is going to stop being so stimulatory, it can't just go, okay, we're going to sell all the bonds now and reduce our balance sheet. It's sitting with these bonds and some of these bonds only mature in, in 20 years time. So its balance sheet is going to remain large for some time and it's going to have to keep being an active player in the market because if it goes in hard, it can't just pull out because then the market will um, freak out and it might do weird things to interest rates. So we've sort of created this new norm and and it is the new norm now and we, we can't reverse it that quickly. I don't think there's necessarily a, a massively bad implications around that. We'll, we'll kind of wait and see. But anyway, that, that is kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the, the big things out of the learnings from the US, isn't it? That, like, it doesn't seem to have increased inflation yet. And that's why uh, there's another reason why I sort of struggle to see the, um, but everywhere is different. So, yeah, I'm going to, I don't want to put too, I'm not going to put a firm view down on this. I sort of have already now where I'm thinking, but I find it very complicated. You to can't backtrack anyway, now. Anyway. <laughs> but uh, thankfully, I am, I consider myself a long term investor who finds it ridiculously impossible to pick a good time to sell. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't really have to bother me too much because I'm, I know that I can't see, I know easily that I don't, can't see 30 years into the future, so I don't have to stress about it. Whereas I find <laughs> looking into the next year much more challenging because we've got so much more information on it, can't make sense of it still. Yeah, exactly. And no one knows. Like every, I talk to all these smart people who follow these things so closely every day and they all say a different thing. So. Right, this has been great to chat. Uh, Sonia, I'll pass over to hopefully get through uh, some of the questions that have been asked by people. Yeah, great. Um, so, Yes, Janae, I think you've been here, done this, but, um, you know, we'll just hit the questions that have come in from um, the people online. And uh, so we're trying to keep answers short and we'll just try and um, get through as many as we can before we have to wrap up. So um, the first one from Will is, um, and you might have covered them, but I think if you can just answer them in, you know, quick little answers if possible. Um, so the first one is, are there any concerns on NZD inflation? Um, yeah, so the New Zealand dollar went up um, after the Reserve Bank suggested that it might increase interest rates as early as next year. So that was a sign that um, inflation was coming. So the New Zealand dollar went up and it's fallen back down a bit. Um, I'm not too sure. Sorry, I don't follow currencies enough to know wh where that might land, um, looking to the media term, medium term. Thanks, Pete. Um, the next one is from Paul. Is uh, is there a chance house prices can go down anytime soon? Um, yeah, definitely. So if people freak out that inflation's coming and interest rates are going up, then they might not be so keen to jump into the market. Um, also, the government's um, stopping investors from writing off their interest as an expense when they pay tax. That is a massive change, and that's a huge cooling factor. The bright line test has been extended from five to 10 years, another cooling factor. Um, we'll see what happens with immigration, wherever the settings land on that will affect the housing market. Um, so yeah, some definite dampening factors, but at the end of the day, if all the stimulus continues and property continues to be really um, attractive asset class, not too sure. Treasury and the Reserve Bank think prices won't fall, but growth will flatline. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, the next one's from Will. Um, will interest rates rise? Yeah, so this is the big question. The Reserve Bank thinks they'll start rising from mid next year. Um, as we've discussed, there's many question marks around that. Some bank economists think they'll start increasing from May next year. Um, I don't know. 
I think it'll the economy would have to show some serious signs of strength for them to start increasing interest rates. Yeah, cool. Um, and then this one, I know we've talked about this as well, but um, how or does a rise in inflation affect the stock market? Is there a trend towards investors investing in the stock market when invest interest rates rise? Yeah, so as Leighton um, explained before, if interest rates rise, it's more attractive um, for people to put their money in the bank. So if people um, decide they can actually get a decent enough return from putting their money in the bank, they might take some of it out of shares and put a little bit more in the bank. So that affects, um, that'll make potentially uh, have a cooling effect on share prices. Um, and over the past year, we've seen the complete opposite. We've seen interest rates go down. It's really unattractive to put your money in the bank. So then you look for alternatives like shares and prices go up. Cool. And the next one, um, what does it mean for the NZ economy that we as a country have so much more debt now after the latest budget release? I don't think it means anything. <laughs> um, well, it does. We, we need to repay the debt. The, I think what we should always do is think about what the alternative is of not having taken out all the debt and the alternative is that we don't stimulate the economy, we didn't have the wage subsidy, people lose their jobs, we don't invest in infrastructure and then we get even more and more behind and our pipes keep bursting and so on. Um, and also, as I said before, it's a pretty big game changer that we the, the Reserve Bank basically owns a bunch of the debt. The debt, we're not indebted to some Chinese bank basically. Not not hugely. <laughs> yeah. And cool. We'll make this um, the lucky last. Uh, but is there a skills lab and labour shortage? I suppose it's good to talk to different different sectors, but definitely there does um, seem to be across the board. And I mean, having our borders closed doesn't help. And the government has focused quite a bit on training, so I think you can get apprenticeships and do that for free and so on. But it takes, it, obviously, you can't train someone up really quickly. It takes quite a while for that to, to filter through. So I think skill shortages are, are a pretty massive issue. Great. Thank you so much, Janae. Um, we're that, time to speed fast in that we well and yeah. out, half an hour out of the water uh look thanks so much uh everyone for tuning in and a really special thank you to janae for your time and for joining us again we really appreciate your insight uh next thursday we're going to be joined by philippa harford she's the cfo of infratil to chat about their latest financial results and what's happening with the company i think that could be a particularly interesting conversation as well given all the infrastructure uh discussion we've had here today and infratil is a large investor in infrastructure um you can register for that through the link in the chat. Um, keep an eye out on Share Club uh, and via the Lunch Money newsletter so that you can see what's going on uh, in markets and uh, see who we've got coming up. Enjoy the weekend and we'll see you next week. Thank you so much, everyone. See ya. Thanks, Janae. Thanks, everyone. Thank